All All right, good morning and welcome to another Practice to Perfect. And today we are going to be listening to uh, Gene Rivers and we're going to be talking about bulletproofing our business with our sphere of influence. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to go over the importance of our sphere of influence and we're going to be diving into how and why we should be looking at them for for a lot, if not most of our business. So um, let's jump into the video and let's hear from Gene. Hi, my name is Gene Rivers. Rivers. My wife, Rebecca, and I have built our real estate business over 32 years. And in those 32 years, we have created 5,600 past clients. And that is a mixture of past clients who repeat and referrals from the past clients. If you look at your local community and look at small businesses, because all of you are small businesses, if they've been open three, four, five years or longer, and you walked into a restaurant like that or a shoe store or a hair salon, the owner would tell you most of the people in there have been there before, and some of them brought their friends today to eat or get their hair done or shop for shoes. This is the nature of being a successful business is providing a service experience where people want to come back and tell their friends to come. This is what we're going to talk about today. Um, the reality is there are four main things you're going to think about when you want to build what I'm describing here is a repeat and referral based business. So we have four lessons today and the lessons are first going to identify, well, what is your sphere? What does that look like? The second issue is going to be what kind of categories you see this big thing called your sphere which could be past clients, family members, friends, whatever, this big thing called sphere has several subgroups. And that's critical because some subgroups get treated differently than other subgroups because of the propensity to create more business for you. So we're gonna talk about the groups. And then we're gonna talk about the nature of the touches. What kind of communications are you doing? What does that look like? We have a tool in Keller Williams called Command. I'm gonna assume a lot of you have heard of Command. And command now allows you to utilize an incredible array of touch concepts. And we're gonna talk about that. And then the last thing is about being strategic. What kind of issues, what kind of concepts should you utilize in building your business? And we're gonna to touch on that. The whole thing is gonna end up being about a group of people that you know, and they know you, and you've got them separated, and you're touching them all generally the same, but specific campaigns with specific groups, and you're doing communications, you're doing education, and you're doing information, and you're doing appreciation. And out of so, I guess what what I like the most about this is that when we start thinking about building a business, right? And and this is a business that we're going to build on a no like and trust basis. And what Gene's getting at too is that we're going to have people in our SOI, our sphere of influence, and they're not all going to be treated equally as far as how we're going to communicate to them, right? If I have a, a relationship with someone that maybe I had just met and have maybe, you know, gone out to, you know, one or two outings with them, I'm going to treat them a little bit different than my family. And what I mean by this is, you know, if I'm going to, maybe I know all my neighbors, um, and I might invite my neighbors over to a block party, right? And so that communication would look a little bit differently, right? I might be sending out some text messages and some, some phone calls and maybe some flyers and some different pieces to invite them over to the block party that I'm going to have for my neighbors. I might not invite all of those same neighbors to a more formal event in my home. And that's what we're going to kind of talk about a little bit, right? And that's why we're going to be able to uh, segment down our groups a little bit because yeah they might all get the same general information and then depending on where they fall we might give them a little bit different of a touch um and then the, the strategic communication guys this is the thing right the mrea the millionaire real estate book the red book teaches us that at the very minimum we need to be reaching out 36 times per year and once we reach out 36 times per year what we do know is this nar tells us that most consumers are not using a real estate agent because they think that they are more knowledgeable and they've been in the business for, for a long time. They use the first agent 
that, um, that they had a conversation with, right? So when they are ready to transact business, we need to be making sure that we've taken that mind share. We need to be making sure that we are systematically and strategically communicating out as many times as possible. So when their hand does go up and they say that I am ready to buy or sell a house, they are thinking of us because we are in closest proximity to them when they are ready to transact. Out of that should come repeat and referral business. This is a look at the numbers of what the, the, the clients say to us. And you'll notice looking at this, the vast majority of buyers and sellers say they consider using the same agent again. And yet the truth is it is a small minority who do. And there are two main reasons for that. One, a lot of agents are not in the business seven years later when most people tend to repeat. But the bigger problem for us is that we don't tend to stay in touch and or ask for the order, meaning ask for the referral or the repeat. So my biggest takeaway from this slide specifically is twofold. One, there's agents getting in and out of the business all the time, right? We understand that there is a high attrition rate inside of the real estate business. It's like any other small business like Gene was talking about, that where four out of five real estate agents are unfortunately will not be in the business within three years. So that's my first aha is that their real estate agent that may have helped them buy or sell is no longer in the business. And the second thing that I think about is most agents don't reach back out to their client. They're very transactional and they're not relationship based. So what would it look like if we were to identify a geographical farm to where we are doing the big mail outs and the different pieces? Because we do know that real estate agents with very large businesses they have a geographical farm and they're going through and they're doing the mail outs and they're doing the yard sales and they're doing all these different pieces. They're door knocking, they're doing open houses, they're doing all these different things that take so much mind share to where the homeowner actually thinks of them as their real estate agent. Because this says that 90 and 87% of the, the consumers would use their agent again and only 12 to 27% actually did. And it really boils down to communication and agents getting in and out of the business. So today is very clearly designed to get your head on straight about the issues of staying in touch and asking for the orders. Um, they will use you again. Look at the numbers. They will use you again if you simply do a good job in communication, appreciation, information, and asking for the order. Uh, the national turnover rate, the national turnover rate is 7% right now, 7%. That means if you have 200 names that you call your sphere, and again, it's different kinds of people, but there are people that know you and you know them. If it's 200 names, there's 14 deals in the next 12 months that those 200 people are going to do. But that's not the end of it. Those 200 people can buy other real estate. And we often don't do a good job in communicating that. There's a large percentage of the population that owns vacation homes, second homes. So you need to be asking about that order too. There are people who also have thought about, but not done real estate investing. You need to be talking about that. There are a lot of small business owners like you and me who are in a building that they rent for their little storefront, but they could actually buy something. So there's small commercial opportunities as well. And should so when I'm thinking about this, guys, my, my biggest takeaway from what Gene's telling me right now is that to become the real estate economist of choice, it's not all about did they just buy and did they just sell? And do we think that they are going to be in the market to do one or the other again? We need to be fi figuring out and having conversations about what are their real estate goals in the next one year, three years five years. Do they want to buy a vacation home? Do they want to buy an investment property? Are they looking to buy or sell their home? Are they looking to purchase a commercial property, right? And I think that there's a lot of times where we start going through our, our, our data bank, right? We start going through our cell phone or our CRM and we're just, or going through Facebook, whatever that looks like. And we're just like, they just bought a home. They just bought a home. They're not in the market. And we never had the conversation with them. And what Gene's also going to be talking about, right, is the value that we're giving them. Are we letting them know, 
how much equity is in their house because I've heard numerous times that the, uh, the, the, the public, right? They, they say something like, you know, I would sell my house, but where would I go right now? Right? Because they think that yes, first and foremost, there is an opportunity with um, the inventory shortages that we have, right? Demand is so high, supply is so very low. And this is the thing, there is big equity in most all of these houses. So what does it look like to start taking Mindshare from our databases and start doing a CMA a day? What if we were to do an equity analysis for our friends, for our family, for our neighbors, right? And every six months, right? We know that we just saw 18% appreciation in Colorado last year. So on average, right? If I were to break that down over 12 months, every six months, right? Their home is appreciating 9%. That's huge dollars, everyone. Like, wouldn't that be great to know that if you were to look at your stocks and your portfolio, that every six months they're going up 9%? That's unheard of. So most people do not understand that their house is doing that. So if you can go through and you just create it, and this is what I would challenge you to do. Create the CMA. Do the different P's, very high level, right? 20,000 foot view and send it off in an email. Right, you send this piece off in the email and then I would follow up with a phone call or a text message, right? You know what, if you wanna enhance it, we know the video's the way to go. What would it look like to send a video message? Hey, this is Charles Coleman. Hey, I didn't know if you just received my equity analysis that I sent for 123 Main Street to you the other day, but if you have any questions, I would love to answer any of them for you. Right, guys, this is the thing. We don't know where people are in their in their real estate journey. And I and I saw a statistic the other day, and I think the Redfin did this study, that most of the buyers right now are investors and in secondary home, right? And so when we start thinking they just bought their house, they just um, they just sold their house, we have a huge opportunity to reach out to see if they're in the market to buy a second property or an investment property. Did you run across a large commercial opportunity? That's a great referral to a member of the commercial side of Keller Williams. So there's a lot of buying and selling this group of people you call your sphere can do. And it starts with the native turnover rate of about 7%. That opportunity is sitting there all the time. This shows you the other opportunity. The other opportunity is referrals. And referrals, frankly, is where the game is. You see, in a shoe store or a hair salon place or a restaurant, it's the repeat where the money is. So they want you to want to come back at least once a week and eat in their restaurant or once every, and I'm not sure about this ratio here, but once every two weeks to get your hair done again. I get a haircut about every two or three weeks, so get your hair cut again. But for us, people typically repeat in seven to 10 years. So it's a long way away. So if I help somebody buy or sell a property and I want them to do it again, I gotta wait too long. But guess what? The referral opportunity is laying there even before they close. Once they're working with me and they see how we operate and they see our appreciation touches that we give them and they realize they haven't worked with realtors like us before in terms of communication and appreciation. It's very exciting and you should understand referrals can come while they're in the process. And if you don't ask, you won't get, but definitely post the process. In the first year, a lot of agents have experienced this in their business. In the first year, if you can get someone to refer you in 12 months or less, so either before the closing or after the closing, no more than a year, the odds of you getting more referrals out of them are high. The odds of you trying to get a referral out of somebody for up to a year and not getting one, the odds of them down the road giving you one are low. So the fact is, we not only uh, know that those referrals are sitting out there, we have to tee them up. We have to communicate, educate, and ask for that order before and during the closing and up to a year in order to stimulate them but it's there. And think about how big this is. If the internal turnover rate on your past clients buying again 
your sphere buying is seven to 10% max. 200 people, 14 deals a year, every 12 months, but each one of them could refer you. So the opportunity for referrals is 200 in a group of 200 of your sphere. The actual total number of opportunities then is the 14 deals that they themselves, this 200 group you call your sphere, are going to buy or sell. And then another 200 referral opportunities, there's 214 potential transactions. So Gene's talking about a couple different things here, right? And one of the things that he's talking about is the, is the referral piece, right? Like we should be going through, every time that we win for a client, we should be asking for a referral, right? So when we get back and we're working for the buy side, and we just hit it out of the park and we get all of the inspection items that they asked for, right? We got all the inspection items that they asked for and you're presenting that good news and you're just, you're saying, you know, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, you know, I'm just, I'm so happy that we were able to win this for you. And I am so grateful to have this opportunity to help you on this home buying journey. And I've loved the interaction that we've had and I love doing business with people like you. Do you know anyone that might also be interested in, in purchasing a house this year that I could help, right? After every win, guys, we need to be saying different pieces like this. And yes, this is the thing, like if you're going out and you've just lost, you know, one, two, three, four deals, that's probably not the ideal time to ask for a referral, right? We wanna make sure that we are asking when we have done something phenomenal and have put them on top and that they are winning and that we want to make sure that we are having that conversation. The second thing that Gene has talked about is the, the life cycle of, of, a, um, of a home transaction, right? And he was saying that seven to 10 years. And through that seven to 10 year piece, right? We, we think that we have the, the year seven to year 10, they buy a house and then we go back and there's year seven, year 10, they're buying another house. And there's all these little pieces, and this is what we're gonna talk a lot about today, is that we need to be reaching out 36 times per year so that we can take mind share, because this is the thing. The seven to 10 year rule, while might be the average, we do know that there's life events. There are life events that pop up to where they might be having to sell their house in two years. They might know someone that might be looking to buy or sell a house. So that's why we need strategic and continuous and systematic communication to these people because we don't know what life events are happening, right? Especially in the world that we're living in with a lot of people working remotely. And I know that a lot of companies are popping up and they're saying, we're getting our people back in two to three times per week. And there's also companies that, that are out there right now that don't have a time back. So we are seeing bigger opportunity for this work from home, which means that they can move out of the city at any point and go to the suburbs. And not only can they go to the suburbs, it can be in any state at this point, and for the most part, any country. So unless we are staying in front of our, our data bank and making sure that we're reaching out and having these conversations, we will not know where they are in that journey. Understanding these numbers creates the awareness you need in order to be really successful getting referral business. And I'm not even adding in the second home and the investment properties to boot. So there's a big opportunity here that's usually untouched by agents. If you look at the lead generation reality for most agents, this chart shows you that most all agents that are doing huge volumes of business still only utilize five or less priorities or lead sources to do the bulk of their business. But guess what? This topic today, the past client repeat and referral or sphere referral business and, and repeat. That business is always in that group because even if you're new to town and you start up your real estate career, by the time three, four or five years have gone down the road, you have radically built up your repeat and referral business. The repeats are just starting, but if you do your job right for three, four or five years, that's all it takes to start getting the referral business rolling. So that business can start up from your first client in a town where you don't know anybody and keep rolling. So think about these, these realities here. You should look at your sphere as one of your primary pillars. For a lot of established agents, the sphere is always gonna be the single biggest source of your business. It doesn't mean it'll be the majority of your business, 
But as the chart shows, you might have one that's 50% or more of your business or 40% of your business. And then the rest are 20, 30, 10. It's more than likely that the one that's the biggest chunk of business is this category. And the truth is, as we discussed in the beginning, over time, it will be the single biggest source over time. My wife and I, our business is past client repeat and referral, and it's about 60 to 70% year after year after year. And that is not accidental. That is intentional, high quality service and communication and information and appreciation. So what I think about this, guys, is that they're talking about repeat and referral business and, you know, speaking to newer agents, right? It's like, Charles, I don't have repeat and referral business, right? And this is the thing. What Gene is talking about is, yeah, obviously, we're not going out and that's how we're starting this thing, but we need to be intentional about creating it. Right, we're gonna go out and do the activities because we know that real estate is a contact sport and we need to be going out and having conversations and we need to be getting as much at bats as possible. And yes, we are gonna fail forward. And the more conversations that we have, the more opportunities that we have to be able to help someone buy and sell real estate. So when you're going through, it does not matter how you're building this thing. This could be door knocking, cold calling, open houses, I'm okay, right? Like, I'm not going to be the person that says you shouldn't buy online leads. But what I will say is this, don't be transactional about it. If you're going to go out and use a third party aggregator to bring in a third party lead, make sure that you are building a relationship to pull them off of that platform and to pull them into your ecosystem, right? Because what Gene is talking about with his business being, you know, 70% repeat and referral business, that is the best return on investment that you can have. Right, because yeah, he's gonna be spending time doing phone calls, text messages, getting out in front of him, maybe some pop buys, whatever that looks like. And it is going to bring him in bigger dollars and less expenses doing it this way. So be thinking about how you enjoy doing your lead generation and how you want your business to look. And then let's get very strategic and purposeful about offering them information about their neighborhood, information about their homes, information about what's happening in the industry, right? And then we're going through and we are, he said, appreciation, right? Guys, we know, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, is that one to two times per year, we should be getting in front of our, our database and having some kind of client appreciation event, right? And one of the things that I know that we're doing back in the market center this year is we're, we're bringing back, you know, breakfast with Santa, Right. And that's one of those things to where, you know, you call out your database and you say, hey, uh, we're bringing Santa in and you just get them in front of you get them in front of you and you're putting on these events and they feel super appreciative. Right. Because no one wants to wait in line for four hours at the mall to be waiting to go talk to Santa. Right. So it's just different things like this. This could be a picnic. This could be a virtual event. Right. But we just need to create some excitement um, around our database pushed out as a system that creates that volume of business that we can count on time after time after time. Now, you're going to have activities in these lessons that you're going to learn, and you're going to either download them ahead of time or download them after the fact, but you're going to need to do the exercise. The point of the exercise is to get you into action. We don't do this. We don't train. We don't teach for just the knowing sake, we do it for the doing sake. And this is your challenge. If you take the materials and don't do the activities, you really are setting yourself up to just basically waste your time. So you need to do the activities. It's key to you getting into gear in your business. Uh so what Gene's talking about guys is that we don't want to be learning for learning's sake. We need to be learning for earning's sake. Right. So we don't sit in the classrooms just because we have a bunch of free time. Right. We're sitting in the classrooms because we want to learn different skills so that we can go implement into our business so that we can build that life by design, not by default. Right. Like we're going through here and we want to be able. Right. We all got into real estate for one reason or another. And I would say that most people is because they didn't want to have a boss anymore. Right. They didn't want to have to be on someone else's nine to five and, and build someone else's net worth up when that person that they understood that could get rid of them at any time. So we wanted to take control of our own destiny. So I just put this first one in the uh, chat 
And for those that are here, you have them in front of you. And here's the first activity. And it's called the power of your sphere. And as you go through here, guys, this is what I want you to do. Take out your cell phones, right? Like, and then if you're an Apple user, right, what you're going to do is you're going to go to your contact section. And then on the far right, there's that pound button or hashtag if you were born in the 90s. It's a hashtag, right? And we're going in and we're going to click that pound symbol. And at the very bottom, it tells you how many contacts you have in your cell phone. Mine says 1,578. If you're an Android user, my suggestion to you would be after this class, go get an iPhone, right? Because I don't know how to, how to tell you how to get to the, the contact section in, in your Android phone, but I can tell you about the Apple products. Um, so if we go through, that's your first number that you're going to put in, right? Because we're going to figure out this mathematical equation. And then your second piece, right? So that's where I'm going to actually put the, that 1,578 for myself. And guys, obviously there's some things in here and this is what I would challenge you to do, right? Like you're gonna say, I already heard it through there. It's a Charles, you know, I don't have a relationship with some of these people anymore. That's, that's an ex-boyfriend, that's an ex-girlfriend. That's, you know, someone that I don't have a relationship with. Guys, this is the thing. If you're not gonna have a conversation with them and you know that there is no world where you're going to reach back out to them, delete them. Just get rid of them out of your phone, right? Pull that through. And yeah, obviously, you, unless you have a fantastic relationship with a pizza delivery person that you see like maybe every Friday delivering you your pizza, right? Like that's also not going to count as well. So go through there, just clean it up and let's just get a, a very clean number of who do we think we can do business with. Number of people that you know, number of people that you know and they know you on social media right like anyone that you're having some conversations with to where um you know who they are they know who you are that you might bump into each other um and that you could actually have a conversation with them and i don't mean just like you know the random person that's going to throw a like here and there like i mean a, a relationship that you have um if you were to go on to facebook linkedin twitter maybe uh instagram TikTok. These are the places where you're going to go and you're going to put these through. Number of people in your database that you know, right? These are going to be people that are in your CRM. If you're with Keller Williams, that, that could be your command. That could be Boomtown. That could be so many other different places. And these are not people that are leads, right? A lead is someone that you're having a one-way communication to, to where they're not talking back. This is a contact. This is someone that you're reaching out to. It's a two-way conversation. You're talking to them. They're talking to you. It doesn't matter how they entered into your CRM, into your database. All that matters is that you have a relationship with them. And then here's your total and they're saying accounting for overlap, right? Like we're gonna go through and whatever that number is, right? We're probably gonna be, you know, in my case, it would probably be around like 2,500 somewhere in there. Those are gonna be my opportunities. And for those that know me, you know that I built my business on social media, right? My business was not built through my cell phone. I mean, it was, this is the platform that I use, but I use Facebook Messenger. Um, and I went through and that's how I did all my communication was through Facebook Messenger and that's how I built my business. So you want to go through and you want to add all these different people up because we know that everything works and nothing doesn't work. And we're going to go through it. And then when we go through here is working with your sphere, one of your top four priorities, right? As we're going through here and we think about our goals, and if you're with inside of a KW, we talk about the GPS, the one, three, five, our one goal, our three priorities and our five strategies. Are we building a game plan around our sphere of influence, right? Yes, open houses are awesome. Door knocking is awesome. Cold calling is awesome. And guess what? Those are all going to be different activities that we're going to use. And we're still going to have to build a relationship with them. They're going to have to know us, like us, and trust us before they're going to do transactions. So we know that these people in this area right here already know us, like us, and trust us. We have conversations with them. We go out to events with these people. So is one of your strategies, your lead gen sources, around your sphere of influence. So it would lead me to my next question. And that is, what are our goals? You know, what is your goal from the class? And what I would think about that is, do you know how many people are in your database? Are there contacts that you need to remove 
from your, your cell phone because they just don't um, add any real value to your to your your life. And what I mean by that is I don't mean like, are they going to bring you in uh, a commission check? But what I mean is if they're just sitting in your cell phone idle and they've been there for three, four, five, ten years and you don't ever plan on having a contact or a conversation with them, I, guys, I would remove them. Um, or if you're going through and you look at a phone number or a name and you're like, I don't know who that person is. Well, we have two options, right? We can reach out to them, we can send them a text, we can give them a call, we can figure out who that person is, or we can delete that person as well. Because if we don't know who they are and when they came into our ecosystem, I, I, I would probably remove that person. I like one of this for a pro tip though, when I'm thinking about this. What I do is I enter in notes when I have a contact. And so, for example, right, we had that our, our vendor partner from Wow One Day Painting yesterday. Um, and after I scrambled around a little bit, I did make sure to put her back into my cell phone. And then I put a note. She came in for the team meeting, right? Like, I, And I put the date. When I'm dealing with a contractor, I actually put what property they helped me with or what client they helped me with and how the service was. So just going through guys and taking notes on who these people are will definitely help you in the long run. I know that Brittany Heckenberg, one of the top agents in Colorado who's a part of our office, what she does is the agents that she's on another side of the transaction with, she'll actually put notes about that agent. So she'll go through and she'll say, uh, this agent was on the buy side of her property on 123 Main Street. And this is where it gets powerful, right? Because the agents that are in the business for a long time, they're gonna bump into the same agents later on down the road. And so let's say that agent now has a listing that one of Brittany's clients is interested in writing on. And Brittany calls them and she says, you know, hey Jeff, this is this is Brittany over at KW, right? She doesn't sound like this, but, right? And we go through and, and she says, hey, um, I just remembered, you know, that we did a transaction about four years ago on 123 Main Street and it was smooth. And I have a client who's interested in 127 Blue Street. I just want to know what it looked like to get a deal put together, right? So guys, taking these notes is huge and we can implement this into our cell phone. We implement this into our CRM. We're going to put this everywhere because knowledge is power once we know we can't unknow and it helps us with a conversation with our follow-up calls right when i started thinking about this into an agent's business and they say charles i'm scared to pick up the phone right and that's why we talk about the ford technique family occupation recreation and dreams and we're going through there and we're taking notes on all this stuff right what's going on with their family are they staying healthy are they employed Right? Are they having any vacations coming up, graduations, any weddings? Like we want to know all this stuff because what this does, this is my second phone call, right? Like I'm going through and now I'm able to go and have a second follow-up conversation. I say, how was the graduation? How was your vacation that you went in this place, right? Because this 500 pound phone gets a lot lighter when I come from curiosity and contribution into someone's life. So guys, that would be my pro tip around this is just taking notes. And I don't care where the notes go in. It can go in your cell phone, into your CRM. I wouldn't put it on a piece of paper. I heard a story the other day, and I think it was, it was Ron in our office talking about this. And he was talking about how uh, someone had a, a sticky note that they were writing on, and they lost the sticky note for a couple months. I would put it somewhere digital. So after this, guys, this is what I want you to do, right? Put your numbers on here. Figure out if lead generation around your SOI is something that you're focused on or is it an opportunity and what your goals are around your sphere of influence. So then we have this case study. And so let me copy the case study and fire it off into the chat. So here's your case study. And it says, Martha Newport in Chapel Hill does 20 million in volume mostly working with her SOI, her sphere of influence, and getting referrals. She follows the 36 to convert touch program with the contacts in her database. She completes the following for each person. She has two touches for Mother's Day and Father's Day cards. She has two touches. Uh, two touches are a card and a phone call for their birthday. Three telephone calls with thank you cards after eight cards to say thank you or that she's thinking of them, 
And then 18 touches split between emails, mailers, letters, cards, personal brochures, marketing reports, just sold, just listed cards, uh, holiday recipe cards, real estate or general news articles, services, directions or directories, promotional items, property alerts, drop off letters of introduction of her new card, right? This is the thing, guys. Anything works, nothing doesn't. And what she is doing is we know that everyone has different ways that they like to be communicated to. That could be cell phone, right? That could be a voice conversation. That could be a text message. That could be through social media. That could be handwritten notes. That could be whatever. We don't know. And that's why we reach out 36 times in different ways. So what she's doing right here is she's sending out a Mother's Day card. And then her follow-up might be a phone call. Hey, just wanted to reach out and see if, you know, how your Mother's Day was. Or her Father's Day, right? Same thing with the birthday. She's going through and she's sending a card and then she's sending a, a phone call later. What would it look like, right, for you to break the norm and not use Facebook to be one of 100 people that wishes someone happy birthday, right? As we're going through, we're sending the card. We're sending a text message. We're giving a phone call. What does it look like to have this in your database? Your database reminds you five days prior to the, uh, to the birthday. And then you send a video and it's, hey, it's Charles over at the office. Just wanted to wish you a happy birthday and beat the rest of the people to it. I hope your day is great, right? We're going through, we fire off that video. We send it over to our database. They also get the card two, three days later. And then maybe it's a phone call to follow up. Hey, did you do anything fun? Right, guys, this is a mind share thing. And we just want them to know that we care, right? There's that, that, that saying that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And if we're doing these different pieces, we're gonna take mind share and we're gonna become the real estate economist of choice. Number five is hugely important, I believe, guys, because they still need to know that we're a real estate agent. Right, and it goes back to when we're talking about like the CMA a day, and then they get one every every or two every year from us. What does it look like if we're going through and we're giving them industry news? We're letting them know that interest rates are going up and going down. Now's the time to refinance. You know, what's happening in the secondary market? What are our thoughts? What are our opinions, right? Guys, we need to become the real estate economist of choice for them. And these are the different pieces that we can do just sold, just listed, uh, news articles about what's happening. And this, guys, this is where it gets simple. You don't have to create this stuff. You go through, you find it on like Housing Wire or HomeSnap, DMAR, RE Colorado, right? They already have, they pay people to publish these articles. And then you just break it down and you say, hey, read this article, thinking of you, here are my thoughts around it, send them the hyperlink, and guys, that's all that you need to do. Like you do not need to recreate the, re the wheel on here. So it says, for her sphere, she not only pops by for lunch, she has special events where she puts fun activity projects for her contacts to make. She invites them to pick up the kit and the supplies, including a tutorial. To connect with her database and promote her events, she has multiple email, phone, and social media touches. After the event, she asked for them to use photos of participants with their completed projects to further promote her business. Guys, how huge is that? What does that look like for you to pick your 10 core advocates, right? Like I'm not asking you to go through and go after your biggest database, your 10 core advocates. You know, these are the people that know, like, and trust you. And if anyone mentions real estate, they're saying you need to call so-and-so, right? And so you find your 10 core advocates, you drop this off, right? And guys, make it whatever it is. Maybe it's a Lego building contest. Maybe it's a gingerbread house building contest, whatever that looks like. And you say, once you've completed, use this hashtag and we will vote for the number one built, insert whatever here, and that person will win a $20 gift card. Right. So now your brand is popping up everywhere. It's your core advocates. These are already the people that love you and trust you, and they're going to promote your business. So I would challenge you guys all to do these different things. Right. And start small. 
I know this is a big undertaking if this is not something that you have already implemented into your business. I am not saying that you need to go out and input everyone in here, but do a real estate activity a day and just start doing these pieces. If you're like, you know what, I could totally get behind this handwritten card thing, do it right and send it out to a couple people and then keep building on it right i know that we, we talk a lot around systems and models and tools and around that real estate agents that have massive businesses are doing two to three hours of lead generation per day guys i'm not challenging you to do that today what i would challenge you to do is spend 30 minutes right start getting to the habits right if this is not something that's already implemented into your business what does it look like to start small and to continue to scale up so what strategies or principles covered in these lessons can you identify Marth with Martha using? So are there any of these pieces that you are doing? Just write them down. Is there anything that you could enhance upon them, right? Like I know that we're all sending the happy birthday post on social media. So what does it look like to start collecting addresses and start sending them a birthday card as well? And then maybe adding an addition to that, you're doing a birthday video or a birthday text or a birthday call follow-up, right? Because you're all doing something like this in your business. Now, how do we enhance it? And then are there strategies described here that you want to start using in your business? I really like the event thing that she does here, right? My biggest takeaway from Martha is that Martha is going through and she's doing these pop buys and she's dropping off things and she's taking massive mind share. And then she's going through and she is having them promote her business on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever that looks like. And then she's rewarding those activities. What would that look like if we were to do a pop by right now, right? It's still cold. If you're in Colorado, we have snow on the ground. What would it look like to go get some seed packets, right? We go, we go to Home Depot, we go to Ector's, we go to work, insert whatever hardware store here, go get some seed packets and then leave the instructions plant this on this date and then the person that has the uh, largest growth over the summer months this is the date that the contest ends will win this from me right and so we're just taking massive mind share we're turning into a competition we're maybe making some follow-up calls right and i'm like you know hey just wanted to reach out and see how your garden was doing right because of the pop by right like i, I did the one pop by it has a lifespan on it now, right? It's not just a one touch and done. This now I'm calling to see how they're growing and I'm reminding them of the competition. Hey, you got 30 days, you have 60 days, right? You have whatever. And then we go through and we're just continuing that life cycle and it's promoting forward. So guys, this was the very first piece around your sphere of influence. Your sphere of influence is huge. And I think that a lot of us have struggles with how do I implement things and oh my god this is huge like how am I going to build a 36 touch and I'm not challenging you to build a 36 touch today I'm challenging you to pick one of these five items and the sixth one is the bonus round right at the very bottom to find one of these things and to slowly implement into your business and start getting the hang of it and then over time we're going to add more and we're going to put more time on it I promise you if you focus on these different pieces to lead generation around your sphere of influence, you will have a massive, massive business. And what we do know is this, right, from the original slides, that 17 to 27% of clients, of consumers, use their agent again. You have an opportunity to keep your clients and you have an opportunity to win over other clients that their real estate agent has forgotten all about them because they were transactional, right? Be the agent that is that real estate economist of choice that is building relationship and is not transactional. Anyways, everyone, I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thank you for participating in Practice to Perfect next week. We will go over defining the categories of your sphere, right? Because this is what we were alluding to in the beginning is that we need to uh, drill down how we are going to label our segments and how we're going to systematically and strategically communicate to each of them because not all of them are the same. Have a great rest of your day and looking forward to connecting next time.